Welcome, everybody. I'm Heather Campion, the CEO of the John F. Kennedy Presidential Library Foundation, and it's my pleasure to welcome you, along with my colleague, the library director here, Tom Putnam, to this evening's forum and to President Kennedy's Library and Museum. It's a national treasure, one of only 13 presidential libraries in America, and our mission is to carry President Kennedy's vision and ideals forward. We do that through educational programming like this, as well as through our museum, which has just been renovated for the first time in many years and has all kinds of wonderful new technologies, so I hope you'll come back and visit to learn more about President Kennedy, his timeless ideas, his courage, and the inspiration he brought to our world. Thanks to our sponsors, these forums are available to audiences all over the world and are now live streamed and rebroadcast on our website and through all of our social media. So I'd like to recognize our leading sponsors and thank them, Bank of America, the Boston Foundation, the Lowell Institute, Raytheon and Viacom, and also our media partners, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. When we reached out to our panelists a few months ago to plan this evening's forum on infrastructure, we of course couldn't have ima imagined what the tragic Amtrak accident last week and all the immediate tension that has ensued, how very timely this conversation would be. What we did know, however, was it seemed appropriate that we have this discussion here at President Kennedy's library, a memorial to a man who believed that Americans could solve the seemingly impossible. Each day in this library, we draw inspiration from our 35th president, who began his quest for the presidency with optimism and inspiration, saying in one of his first televised debates, I don't believe there is anything that this country cannot do. As president, he challenged us to tackle big issues, and America delivered. And here are just a few. The Peace Corps, within the first year of his presidency, he established it, and within just nine months, over 500 Americans went to nine different countries as Peace Corps volunteers. The space program, where he challenged Americans with the goal of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth within a decade. He warned that committing to this effort would take, quote, many years and carry very heavy costs. Well, as we know, Congress did commit to the funds $24 billion at the time, and despite the large financial and technological advantages that the Russian space program had initially, in just eight years, two American astronauts were the first to land on the moon. And finally, the President's proudest achievement, signing the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which actually we have on display in our museum downstairs. Following the Bay of Pigs, a Chile meeting in Vienna with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev and the Cuban Missile Crisis, which brought us to the brink of nuclear war, President Kennedy was determined to seek out the way of peace with the Soviet Union, and in October 1963, he signed the Limited Nuclear Test Ban Treaty with them. I share these examples of big goals and big achievements within the span of a 1,000-day presidency in hopes that a visit here to this library will remind you of how, as a country, we are capable of doing big things. This evening's topic is about a new big challenge facing America, the state of our nation's infrastructure. To tackle this topic, we are so fortunate to have a group of distinguished Americans, each of whom are visionaries and also know how to get things done. First, the inspiration for this evening's forum is Professor Rosabeth Moss Cantor and her new book, right here, Move, Putting America's Infrastructure Back in the Lead. It's on sale in our museum store, and Professor Cantor will be signing copies at the conclusion of this forum. One of the first women to receive tenure at the Harvard Business School, she specializes in the areas that seem essential for tackle, tackling this issue, strategy, innovation, and leadership for change. In addition to teaching at Harvard, she also founded the, the Harvard's Advanced Leadership Initiative, which helps successful leaders apply their skills to national and global challenges. 
She's received numerous awards, including being named one of the 50 most powerful women in the world by the Times of London. And she's written numerous books on business management, and I also recently learned co-authored one back in 1988 with Governor Michael Dukakis entitled Creating the Future. We're also very pleased to have here this evening our state's longest serving governor, Michael Dukakis, whose administration laid the groundwork for literally changing the face of this commonwealth. Where would we be without the imagination and the innovation that he brought to our state's transportation system? Leading the effort to engineer the big dig, suppressing the aging artery that divided our city, giving us the Rose Kennedy Greenway, and a new connection to Logan Airport with, with the Ted Williams Tunnel. It's hard to imagine Boston today without that infrastructure, and all of these initiatives began during his administration. Fittingly, the state's busiest transportation hub, South Station, has recently been renamed the Governor Michael S. Dukakis Transportation Center. We're also pleased to have here today Governor Ed Rendell. As the former mayor of Philadelphia, where he became known as America's mayor, having presided over what the New York Times called at the time the most stunning turnaround in recent urban history. And as governor of Pennsylvania, he's long been an articulate national voice on the dire state of our transit system. A few years ago, with former mayor Michael Bloomberg and former governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, they co-founded the bipartisan group Building America's Infrastructure, which is dedicated to bringing a new era of investment in infrastructure that enhances our country's prosperity and quality of life. And in case you missed it, last night, 60 Minutes did a repeat of an interview that he had with Steve Cross on this important topic. And finally, our moderator this evening is the New York Times national correspondent, Jackie Combs. We've been fortunate to have her here in the Commonwealth this spring, where she's been a fellow at the Shorenstein Center's Kennedy School at Harvard. At the New York Times, she's covered the financial crisis, presidential elections, and the Obama White House. Previously, she was at the Wall Street Journal for nearly two decades as chief political correspondent for their Washington Bureau, where she covered both the White House and Congress with a focus on budget and tax legislation. She brings both expertise and special insight into the issue of infrastructure, and we're particularly fortunate to have her with us to moderate this forum. As we begin this discussion about one of our country's most pressing problems, I want to leave you with a quote that President Kennedy gave at American University in 1963, and one that I hope will be motivating for all of us here today. He said, I quote, our problems are man-made, therefore they can be solved by man, and man can be as big as he wants, for no human destiny is beyond human beings. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Well, I for one am uh, gratified to see this many people here to talk about a the subject of infrastructure. I, um, I cannot hear that word without thinking back almost 40 years to when I, uh, my first day at grad school at Northwestern, and um, it was a class uh, on urban, urban problems. In fact, it's funny, in, in Rosabeth's book she says, uh, she's talking about how cities are coming back, and she said it used to be you didn't have the word urban without the word problems following it. So I just thought of that from your book when I said this. But anyway, this, this old professor says to the class, there's one word I want you to never forget. And I, it felt like that scene in the movie, the, the, you know, uh, the Graduate, when the next word's going to be plastics. Instead, it was infrastructure. And I never have forgotten it. But I have to say, nearly 40 years later, I, I'm a little surprised that a word like infrastructure still is in use because I thought people might have come up with something better. And so I just wanted to start asking, what was wrong with public works, you know, for the public? <laughs> and it works. Is there a better word than infrastructure, Rosabeth? And 
<laughs> well, Governors. almost any word is better than infrastructure because it's a mouthful. <laughs> My publisher said, however, also presciently, he said, I wanted to have the subtitle be something else. He said, no, infrastructure, this is how he put it, is the money word. That's what people, that's what's on people's minds because suddenly they realize that the structures underlying everything we're doing aren't necessarily working. It's the thing we don't want to think about. We want to have it just work, no matter what. And so all of a sudden, it's back on our minds. It's never really been gone from policy circles or from professionals or from the distinguished governors that I am honored to be sitting between. Um, they all had to think about it, but for the public to do it. So last summer when I was writing, um, and people would say, what are you working on? And I would say a little kind of, like I didn't want to say much about it. I was a little sheepish about it. Well, I'm doing a book on infrastructure. Thinking that that would, they'd change the subject. And everybody had a story. Everybody immediately started talking about their pothole, their delayed flights, their rotten commute, <laughs> their breakdown on the light rail commuter line they took. It was amazing. I couldn't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> so this is on people's minds, primarily because it's not working. And if I can say one more thing, since the time when I had the privilege to be learning from Gov Governor Dukakis when he was in the State House. One thing that has changed, aside from it's rotten, um, I mean, it really does need not only to be repaired, but it also needs to be reinvented. Because one thing that's changed is other countries have leapt ahead, if leaping ahead is the right metaphor when we're talking about trains and infrastructure, but they are so far ahead of us. And just one little anecdote. So. Um, an American delegation, U.S. delegation, went to Japan and where Ambassador Kennedy also hosted them, but they went to Japan for the 50th anniversary of the bullet train. The bullet train goes 200 miles per hour, almost minimum. I think they just had some racing trains that might have gone up to as much as 600 kilometers per hour. 50 years. And we can't get the Excella as our high-speed train, and it can't go even at full speed, 150 miles per hour, for much more than a short stretch in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. So, you know, we go, we feel like the provincials in these places. The other thing about the bullet train is that in the last few years, it's deviated from schedule on average 32 seconds. Wow. So... It's not simply that we need to re I talk about the three R's. It's not simply that we need to repair. We also need to renew and reinvent. Mm -hmm. We need innovation. We need Massachusetts, actually. We need the entrepreneurs. We need the best thinking of people who can imagine how things could be different. Not just in good repair, although I think a lot of us would settle for that but how they could be different, how we could truly create the future. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to get the governor's in, and I don't want to jump around, but I have to ask you quickly. You mentioned Tokyo's bullet train in your book, but you also seem to think bullet trains are a pipe dream, that you're, you don't think that's a way for us to go. Well, in the U.S. at the moment, since there's been talk about high-speed rail for several decades, and the Excella um, was supposed to be doing it, but I leave that to um, my governor friend to my right. Um, but it, they're not quite, because there are two private groups that are now trying to build bullet trains. They're, they've started the companies, and one that wants to do a maglev, which is even more visionary, because the train is riding on magnets. It's not even mm -hmm. touching the rails. You need totally new rails for that. One is in Texas, Texas Central Railroad, and most people don't know this, even if you voted for him, but the general manager of Texas Central before he came back to Massachusetts to run for Congress was Seth Moulton. So he's a train guy. Um, and the other one is called All Aboard Florida. And there, so the Texas Central is trying to build high-speed rail between um, Dallas and Houston. That would transform an already booming Texas economy. Mm -hmm. 
And in um, Florida, it's between Miami and Orlando, yeah. which would also, be, and I've heard talk about that for at least three decades, but now there's a group putting in private money to actually do it. And one more nice element is that they're putting in a terminal in Miami, in a northern part of Miami, and all of a sudden, there's more interest in light rail in Miami, which desperately needs it, horrible con traffic congestion, and that all aboard Florida rail terminal suddenly provides a reason for the local officials to say, hey, we could use that to connect to a new light rail system. So it's gonna have a catalytic mm -hmm. effect. So there is dream of a bullet train. I was just saying we can't sit around and wait right. because those things are very long term. We must also repair and renew yeah. right now. Well, let's stay on rail briefly to deal with the 800 pound gorilla in the room. In, in my business, we love news pegs if it makes things timely, but uh, no one would have wished this Amtrak um, tragedy. Um, so we have two governors who, for, who have been really close to Amtrak business. Governor Dukakis, you were on the board. What lessons, do, you, do we know yet what lessons we can take from this, well, Governor Rendell? Turn to my friend from Philadelphia. First of all, Rosabeth, there was a time you couldn't get a word in edgewise. <laughs> <laughs> I find that shocking, shocking. Um, I, I want to go back to your first question, Jackie. When we founded Building America's <laughs> Future, we had a press conference in California where Bloomberg, Governor Schwarzenegger, and myself, and Governor Schwarzenegger spoke and he said, one of the problems is Americans don't know about infrastructure. And I think Rosabeth is right. In seven years, that's changed dramatically. Unfortunately, it's changed because of a lot of tragedies. But Governor Schwarzenegger told a story that his eight-year-old son said the night before seeing his schedule, Daddy, what's infrastructure? And Arnold said, it's what Daddy blows up in the movies. And that was probably <laughs> as good a definition as there was around. Well, before I get started, I want to say what an honor it is not only to be here with the professor, and this is a great book. She gave it to me last week, and I've read a little bit of it. But also Governor Dukakis, who uh, it was heartbreaking that uh, he didn't, in my judgment, that he didn't become president. And I was particularly heartbroken because I was a young elected district attorney, and Kitty Dukakis came in to, to campaign in the Pennsylvania primary, and I was her driver for a day. <laughs> In fact, we still refer to Ed as Kitty's advance. <laughs> and we're <laughs> stuck in traffic. No, actually not that day. And Kitty, Kitty wowed them, but uh, that's another story. So, so he, here's the problem. The problem with trying to improve or repair our existing rail passenger rail system is it can't be. Because the tracks are laid from Washington to Boston in such a way that they're what happened in Philadelphia, the, the fairly steep curve, is not unique. In fact, it's prevalent all around the route. The Acela, as Rosabeth said, can go 150 miles an hour on a straightaway. But the Acela is forced to, to drive over tracks that are curved, over tracks that are shared with freight rail and commuter rail. Can you, none, none of the European or Asian rail systems have anything but a dedicated passenger rail line. They don't share it with anybody. The Acela averages from Washington to Boston 80 miles an hour. 60 years ago, we had a train that averaged 70 miles an hour. It cannot be repaired. It cannot be repaired. You can put in all sorts of different changes to make it a little safer, to do a little upgrade, but it cannot be repaired. Until you have a dedicated line, whether it's for the bullet train or I, I've ridden the Japanese maglev, 317 miles an hour, and you could stand up. Governor Pataki was with me. He stood up, took out a little pad, and wrote a note to Joe Boardman, the CEO of SEPTA, and his hand didn't deviate a second. That's how uh, uh, safe the, uh, and comfortable the ride was. No shaking or anything, because you're six inches above the ground. We cannot repair it. We have to get serious. If we want a first-class infrastructure, and Rosabeth is right, 11 years ago, the World Economic Forum ranked us number one in the world in the competitiveness of our infrastructure. Today, we rank 16th behind Malaysia and Iceland. 
Malaysia and Iceland. And it is going downhill fast, downhill fast. We only had one blip when infrastructure ticked up a little bit, and that was during stimulus, the much derided stimulus. The biggest problem with stimulus was $350 billion of the 850 went to a tax cut that didn't do much at all, and only $70, million, $70 billion went to infrastructure. There should have been three times the amount of money dedicated to infrastructure. So let's forget the idea that we can repair our infrastructure. We have to start and do what every one of the G20 nations did, and that's have a long-term seven, eight, nine, ten-year infrastructure revitalization program. It would do more for the American economy. It would do more for job creation. Those well-paying seventy, eighty thousand dollars a year jobs in factories and on construction sites that all the politicians in both parties talk about. It would improve our public safety and our quality of life. It's time to do it. It's time to get serious. It's time to do what President Kennedy would have done. He would have taken the problem by the horns and said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to fix this problem, and we're going to fix it in this decade. Governor Dukakis. Well, I can't say much more than both uh, Elizabeth and, and Ed have said, uh, except to simply say this. Uh, Kitty and I had the great good fortune, first a confession. As you know, uh, we spend the winter in Los Angeles. Mm. It's, a terrible, it's a terrible burden, but somebody has to do it. So we drag ourselves out of New England the day after Christmas, Christmas which happens to be Kitty's birthday. <laughs> and uh, we come back in early April, and I teach during the winter quarter at UCLA. Um, they call it so spring we, quarter we, here, spring semester. Well, spring quarter, yeah. <laughs> so, no, winter quarter. I teach in the winter quarter, and they have a spring quarter. In any event, um, so we were watching from afar as my favorite transit system collapsed. Don't get me started on that if you want to. I mean, we got the system That's back in action in 36 hours in 1978. I'm sure there's a lot of people here that would like to hear if you so have an I'm, answer for the well, tea. Anyway, we'll, we'll have another one on that. Um, <laughs> But I want to tell you, folks, after spending a week in Japan, and I was there as a young GI stationed in Korea in the 50s, and remember, 1963 was not long after we practically destroyed Japan in World War II, and the Shinkansen began in 63, at only 130, right? Now it's a 200, and when we were there, they had just tested their latest, and this is not just a fly-by-night thing. They're going to go to work on this. They had just tested their intercity maglev and top speeds of 300 miles or better and they're going to build it folks it's positively embarrassing to come back to the united states the bridges look as if they were painted yesterday uh, there are 12 subway lines in tokyo one built under the last one it takes three escalators to get down to the uh, a first-rate commuter rail system and of course uh, high-speed rail everywhere um, and you got to ask yourselves, I mean, where are we in all of this? And the answer is nowhere. And the thing that concerns me is that at least when I was on the Amtrak board, there was a bipartisan majority in the Congress for investing certainly in Amtrak and in infrastructure generally. In fact, in George Bush's last year, Congress passed a major Amtrak bill that included significant investment in Amtrak. And uh, everybody thought he was going to veto it. He didn't because he would have been overridden by a two-thirds vote in the House and Senate. Now, that was 2008, folks. And one of the things I don't understand, Ed and Rosabeth, is where the hell is that bipartisan majority? Um, it certainly was there just a few years ago. And I don't quite understand. I understand we've got some different, interesting people in the House, but I don't understand and in the Senate why that broad bipartisan majority for investment in this country's infrastructure still isn't there. I, I think I can give a short answer to that because those <coughs> senators are worried about those interesting people in the House running against them. This is all, you can blame it all on Grover Nordquist. Grover Nordquist has gotten so many of these cowards, and they are cowards, to sign that no revenue pledge, which is absolutely ridiculous how you could sign before taking office a pledge that will govern your conduct. He's gotten them to sign this pledge. Did anybody here vote for Grover or Norquist? 
Has anybody ever seen Grover Nordquist? Yes. It's a little bit like the Wizard of Oz when you pull back the curtain. There's not much there there. <laughs> and yet he's terrified everybody in Washington. And born and brought up in Weston, Massachusetts. Oh. That's the thing. Oh. And he went huh? to Harvard. I no. didn't know that. He did? Yes, Harvard indeed. Business School. I'm ashamed to say, but... Um, no. that, but, you know, that is, um, is one of the reasons, though, that we know that this is a problem. I mean, not only are we stuck in traffic, um, we're stuck in gridlock, and we're stuck in the past. That's the other thing. Right. We should get back right. to how we got to this point. But the, I, that's why I didn't really write about Congress. I really write about innovation. I write a certain amount about the private sector, private investment, about private investors partnering in good partnerships. There are also some bad ones with the private sector. I have mm -hmm. my, if we ever get around to the, the tunnel I'm in love with, the Port of Miami Tunnel, um, a, a very human and a story of transcending politics, but of also getting something really good for the city, for people, and for the country, because it helps us get the goods we need. We'll get to that. But um, the private sector and innovation and why, again, I'm proud to be here in Massachusetts where tech entrepreneurs are starting to think about this sector and um, the city of Boston has, is doing amazing things in the new urban mechanics lab where they're partnering with entrepreneurs to provide apps that are doing things to make traffic flow better and people find parking and your car say when the road needs to be repaired because of the vibrations in the car. So 2008, I think that's a, a terrific year to think about because the political scene got very, very, very tough. But the opportunity for innovation suddenly got good because Apple unveiled the first real smartphone in 2007. And that is starting to have some transformational potentially transformational effects. And mm -hmm. even the positive train control right. on the Amtrak train that wasn't quite working because we don't have enough broadband, which is another mm -hmm. infrastructure problem, that was because of technology making possible safer That's journeys. Right. But be, be clear about one thing, though. Technology will help. The private sector will help. States have stepped up all across the country. Red states, blue states have raised their own gas tax, have done interesting things. Roosevelt is right, technology is exploding. We know we're gonna have to go to a vehicle miles travel uh, system to replace the gas tax. There's a gentleman here by the name of Kevin Condon who has a co company by the name of Verdeva who's working on a vehicle miles traveled that is non-intrusive, that is actually at the pump so you don't have any of the privacy concerns. We're gonna get places but we're never going to have a national transportation plan without the federal government. Forget about it. We're never going to have enough resources. 52% of all the highway and bridge money that states use comes from the federal government. You won't be able to replace it. Pennsylvania's got 4,500 structurally deficient bridges. We could toll 15 of them so the private sector would have a rate of return. The other 4,400 plus government's going to have to do. So I totally, I know, I'm, but, I, but I totally agree with you and think that it's not only, only the federal governor, government can raise it, the, re, the resources, also only the federal government you can have it. a national vision. Sure. Yeah, I mean, this is one country. The, the thing that's so ironic is transportation is the one thing that connects city to city, state to state, connects the nation. That's what the Interstate Highway Act was. So you also need national leadership to envision a national system and sell it to the country as something that's good for every part of the country. Well, I was struck when Governor Dukakis, when you told me earlier about um, your experience on the Amtrak board and, and recalling the bipartisanship that usually was behind infrastructure legislation, and I saw that over three decades. Um, uh, but that you now have, and Public Works Committee in the House is the largest committee, 50-some uh, members. They had to extend it out into the room and take up public seating because people wanted to be on it to get things back to their district. And, you know, that's not so anymore in the era of earmarks, but there's it's still a lot of people. Um, maybe, we, but, maybe we ought to go back to earmarks. 
Maybe that's the problem. You know, earmarks, kidding. that's a whole other forum to be had, but there, there's an argument to be made for earmarks, and I say as someone who's written negatively about them more than once, but I, 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 because I was struck by your comment, I went back and looked, um, because in addition, we know that the, the Republican Party's base ideologically has shifted more to the right in the last, certainly in the last few years, but actually over several decades. But more important, I think, to this discussion is the geographic shift that's reflected there to the South and the West. So I want to look where the leadership, now that Republicans control Congress and we have a highway trust fund that's run out of money and likely to have just a Band-Aid bill this summer while they keep trying to come up with something permanent. But the Senate leaders now are from, and when I think that the, most of the infrastructure as we think of it, and certainly rail, is on the coast, by coastal and in the big cities, and moderate-sized cities. But the Senate leaders are from Kentucky, South Dakota, and Texas, uh, and the leaders of the fiscal committees, budget appropriations and finance, are from Wyoming, Utah, and Mississippi. In the House, the Republican leaders are from my home state of Ohio, but he's from exurban Ohio, uh, rural California, and Louisiana. The chairman of the three fiscal committees are from Georgia, Wisconsin, and Kentucky. You know, so that sort of tells you where they're coming from geographically on uh, some of these major infrastructure questions. How do you, and, and then you add layer on that, the ideology uh, and the Tea Party uh, sentiment now, which got a big, you know, the bridge to nowhere lives on as a, as a metaphor. So how do you address, especially, I mean, Governor Rendell, you go, you talk to members of Congress about these issues. Governor Dukakis, I'm sure you still do in your various ventures. How do you address Republicans these Well, days? let me say this. Uh, to be sure, the Democrats only controlled the Congress for a couple of years at the time that President Obama was first elected. And uh, he proposed and the Congress voted $8 billion as a down payment mm -hmm. on what was going to be a first-class national rail passenger system. For the $8 billion that was voted, DOT received over $100 billion in requests from states all over the country. And it wasn't just from the coast, folks. Rail is big in the South. Uh, our long-distance trains that provide service to the northern tier of the states are hugely valued by those folks. And uh, there isn't a part of this country, Midwest is a natural for this, there isn't a part of the country where rail is not advocated, including, as we heard, this private or semi-private project in Texas. So uh, this is an extremely popular thing, believe me, and has uh, a lot of support at the grassroots. Uh, and in point of fact, Ed, although you're right about the fact that this has got to be in Rosabeth, it's got to be a national plan, a national vision, it's interesting that it's been mayors in some cases. Mm -hmm. John Hickenlooper, when he was the mayor of Denver, Antonio Villaigosa, when he was the mayor of Los Angeles, that pushed successfully for increases in local sales taxes right. that were voted in Los Angeles. Can you believe this? The automobile capital of the world. The, the citizens of Los Angeles County voted by better than two-thirds to raise their sales taxes to pay for what is now a major, major expansion of rail-based transit in Los Angeles. Think about it. So nobody's going to tell me that there isn't broad-based support for this cross-country. Denver, under Hickenlooper's le leadership, with those 38 communities, uh, has done exactly the same thing, raised their sales taxes. Now, that's absolutely right. I mean, this has got to be a national program, and we need a national commitment here. But um, this is a hugely popular thing, which gave rise to my question to you, which is, so if it's so popular, why isn't the Congress reflecting that? And remember, the Republican Party has a long and proud history of this. The Republican platform of 1860 <laughs> committed itself to building the Transcontinental Railroad. And the president who principally responsible for the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad was who? Abe Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> In the middle of the Civil War. In the War. middle of a bad period during the Civil War, folks. So, um, and the, the Republicans that I served with 
on the Amtrak board. Tommy Thompson, no lefty, very conservative governor of Wisconsin, but a good guy, very committed to this. Linwood Holton, the first Republican elected governor since Reconstruction in Virginia, and the first civil rights governor of Virginia, who happens to be the father-in-law of Tim Kaine, the Democratic senator. And a remarkable guy named John Robert Smith, who was the four-term mayor of Meridian, Mississippi, and one of the best people I've ever worked with. All strongly committed to this. So I continue to be puzzled. Why well, isn't this translating into my strong theory, support? There, there are two reasons. One, because of Grover Norquist. You talk about that How committee. How do you pay for it? You talk about that committee. Uh, when Bob Schuster became the chairman of that committee, he's from Pennsylvania, he invited me the head of the laborers' union and Frank uh, uh, Donahue, the exec CEO of the chamber, the U.S. chamber, to testify. And we testified, and then literally there were 57 members of the committee present, and every one of them stood up and said, we need to do something about this infrastructure. I'm a Tea Party member, but I'm committed to doing something about this infrastructure. But nobody wants to pay for it. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to go on record. <clears throat> if there were a secret ballot, on raising the gas tax. We'd get 385 votes in the House and 85 votes in the Senate. So that's number one. Number two is there's a misconception about, let's take rail for ex uh, uh, example. I testified on behalf of Amtrak when I was uh, in my first couple of years as governor. Senator Shelby of Alabama said to me, but governor, you're asking us to subsidize Amtrak. <laughs> and I was stunned. There isn't a rail line anywhere in the world, in the United States, in Asia, in Europe. There isn't a rail line anywhere in the world that's paid for by the fare box. Everything gets subsidized. All those great things. Philadelphia's got a great subway system. 50% of the funds come from the state. 50% of the funds come from the state. Another 12% come from the five counties in the area. The fare box only pays for about 38% of the of the cost. So that's why. They've got this unrealistic idea, well, let the private sector do it. Well, yeah, the private sector will do it if we give them uh, accountability payments mm -hmm. to make up for the difference in, in the cost. I mean, they've just got this pie-in-the-sky idea of where it's going to come from. There was a song, and I will give you two tickets to the next Philadelphia 76ers championship basketball game. <laughs> if you can tell me the group who, who sang it, it was the key lyrics was money for nothing and chicks for free. Dire Straits. Dire Straits. <laughs> you, you, you're you're, pro you're probably things. too old to, to, say, to qualify for the Sixers. <laughs> but it'll be a while. It'll be a while. But, but the, answer is, the answer is that's what they want. That's what they want. And I was talking to uh, Rosabeth knows this. I we were down together at something that Bloomberg did on infrastructure last Monday, because last week was infrastructure week. Then I went to Brookings. And go online and look up Brookings Hamilton Project Infrastructure. Roger Altman used to be with uh, Bill Clinton. And Brookline a, boy. Right, a Bro Brookline boy? Brookline boy. Is everyone in the world from Massachusetts? Yes. Kind of, yeah. As a matter of fact, let me interrupt for a second. You will discover that this great tunnel project in Miami that uh, Rosabeth devotes a full chapter to, was largely quarterbacked by three Massachusetts folks. Two work for me, and one who used to be in the legislature from the Berkshires. Those are the folks that made that project work. Well, oh, yeah. a certain the, amount of pride. The Hamilton has to be expressed. <laughs> I'll tell the story later. The Hamilton Project has four ideas to help create funding for infrastructure, significant funding that don't impact the federal deficit. And I'll just give you two. There's a program called TIFIA, the Transportation Infrastructure Financing Authority, where it's essentially a loan program. The federal government can loan it money to states, to cities, or to private public partnerships. For every $1 that goes out in loans, it produces $10 in development. It was so successful that the Congress in MAP 21 raised the federal authority uh, from $225 million to $1 billion. They proposed raising it to $10 billion that would produce $100 billion in uh, authority. TIFI has loaned out 58 projects. Only two have failed to repay fully 
Uh, so it's a zero-sum game. The second project is Building America's Bonds, which were part of stimulus and maybe the most successful part of stimulus. Unlike most municipal and state bonds, they are taxable. Municipal and state bonds for bridges and roads are tax-free. Since they're taxable, the federal government pays 28% of the interest, which makes it easier for states and cities to float these bonds. And because they're taxable, they get back that payment almost dollar for dollar, zero sum. We could do another $100 billion with BABs back in the fold. It's no, it's, it is no substitute for a well thought out long term program, but we should be doing stuff like that. I can't understand why we're not. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's sensible, so I don't know how much we can count on good sense. But also, um, there is money, that's the thing. There is money, and when you stimulate the economy, of course, you produce more money, but there is money. There's money waiting in the wings. So aside from the fact that there are forms of bonds, and by the way, I say in my finance chapter, which I tried to make really human and friendly, so that's the one with the tunnel, but I went to college on municipal bonds. My father, that was way back in the times when, long time ago, people still cu cut coupons. So we have that the world envied us for having financing systems like that. But there's money in this country and elsewhere that's not investing here because of politics, because of uncertainty because of uncertainty about whether a project will be canceled, uncertainty about whether there's sufficient support. And so one thing we need to do is reduce the uncertainty. That the Massachusetts people that um, Mike Dukakis referred to um, are part of a financing firm, but mm -hmm. the headquarters of the firm is in France. And I have nothing against taking foreign capital. I think it's a great idea. but. Um, you know, they had to have real belief that the project would be completed and the politics would be out of the way before they would do it. Many of you know Jane Garvey. She's a co-chair of the firm. She was um, Federal Aviation Authority head. And what did she do in your administration? She Massport? was, she was a Maybe. high school teacher in Amherst. With Not great, in your, yeah? With great political skills. <laughs> who uh, ran Hampshire and Franklin County for me in the 1982 campaign. <laughs> and Fred Salvucci, a great man, came to me and he said, at that time we had four associate commissioners of public works, as we call it. <laughs> Good he said phrase. to me, uh, <laughs> what do you, I need somebody who can work with those hill towns out in the western part of the state to get a lot of state aid for their roads. What do you think of Jane? I said, you're the secretary, pal. I'm not making these appointments, it's up to you. I'm holding you accountable. And Jane became first an associate Commissioner of Public Works, and subsequently the commissioner. And she had this amazing ability to work with engineers and construction people in the unions. And I finally said to her one day, you know, this is really, I mean, you were teaching social studies at Amherst High School. Where did you get this? Now, her married name is Garvey. She said, Michael, I'm an Italian. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> she was. She was so, Italian. Can and I, she went on. Joe Aiello, so, who is Italian American, yeah. is the other guy. Right. A kid out of East Boston, who went to UMass, then got a master's in city planning at MIT, became an assistant secretary to Fred, then went over and became an assistant uh, general manager to T. Uh, it does take people. It does take people who know how to get, mm -hmm. know how to get things done, and by the way, have formidable political and consensus building skills as so well. So the, the visionary behind the tunnel was a Cuban American who had come over by himself at the age of 15, I think on the Pedro Pan Express. You know, immigrants, we have a great story in America about building America. The reason I love that, that you talked about Jane Garvey was, and another goal I had in writing this, because I could do a lot of things, uh, besides caring about my country, I really think this is such an important family issue, people issue. I named every woman I could find to name in this book because this shouldn't be a guy's field. This is our commute to work. This is our kid getting to school. This is our health, the air we breathe. This is the environment. This issue is a person's issue, a woman's issue, and we have to take 
hold of it because maybe the other people who haven't haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not that it's not a technical issue either. Well, maybe we'll get a woman in charge of the nation's <laughs> infrastructure. <laughs> hey, do you think? Just saying. <laughs> yes, you were. <laughs> Duly noted. And, um, and by the way, we're, we're providing a lot of talent from here. I mean, what is it about New Yorkers? <laughs> they want Massachusetts folks to be their mayors. <laughs> their police commissioner is a guy from Massachusetts. When the MTA, the Metropolitan <laughs> Transit Authority of New York, which, by the way, includes commuter rail as well as the transit system, was in terrible shape. Bob Kiley, who had run the tea for me, went down there and straightened that out. And then, by the way, was recruited by London to go to London and straighten out the London Underground. Had a great experience. He said there was only one problem in London. You couldn't get a decent bagel. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does, folks, it does take people. It does take talent. And I might say it does take guts. Right. We raised the gasoline tax 10 cents. At, a, at the worst possible time politically, as we were starting to go into a recession in my last couple of years. And Jerry Brett and his colleagues had the guts to stand up. We did the best we could to try to create some kind of political environment in which they could be supported. They had the guts to stand up as we were going into another terrible recession and vote, can you believe it, an increase of a dime. But that's a I very important that. point, Mike. Pennsylvania just, with a Republican governor and a Republican legislature last year, uh, and I went and stood by the Republican governor when he introduced this, introduced a five-year incremental increase in the gas tax of 28 cents a gallon on top of an existing gas tax. It produces $2.3 billion a year for mass transit and for roads, bridges, and highways. The next election, not one incumbent, Republican or Democrat, who voted for the gas tax increase lost, not one. And in every one of their race, races, the issue was brought up, but, not one lost. But the governor lost. Was it an issue in his no, defeat? No, no, that was another problem. But we have, you know, so um, there's another problem that we've had in Massachusetts, and that is Governor Patrick had argued for a bigger increase in the gas tax than the legislature was willing to support on another set of grounds, which is it would hit poor people would hit the lower income harder than the upper income because it isn't too much of a progressive tax. So I just want to say that because that, that was very sad because we could have done more here. There's a lot of innovative things going on here, including instant bridges. I love the 14 bridges in 14 weekends project. Imagining that, imagine mm -hmm. that. I mean, new stuff without disruption to the roads. But it was hard to get it through 14, a Democratic legislature. 14 bridges and 14 weekends? 14 weekend? weekends, each one Wait, one weekend. Who, who built them, the Amish? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very, that's from Pennsylvania. If we had gotten them from Pennsylvania, no, no, this is pre-built and dropped pre -built in place and, over um, Chicago has done that as they've tried to untangle some you of the rail tracks. You folks drive over those bridges? <laughs> I'd rather drive on one of those bridges than, say, across the bridge between Harvard Square and Harvard Business School, but that's another issue. Yeah. But the point is, there are difficulties on all sides, and that's why I also think we need a rethinking. I mean, so both of you have held high elective office, and you've had to make these political trade-offs. One of the luxuries of being um, an, an intellectual is that I can step back and say, how do we put this in perspective and maybe rethink it um, as we're, bat we're doing the battle? We have to make some decisions. The highway trust fund will run out of money. We have to make some decisions. But on the other hand, as you even said, it's kind of an obsolete concept if you think about it. It can't make enough money, higher fuel efficiency. There are a lot of people without cars. There are electric cars which are coming, and the battery technology is going to come pretty fast, um, faster than we think. So I'm hoping that by giving people perspective, because the fun part is, you know, why can't we get this, and pointing fingers and blaming, and then we go home to the same old traffic jam. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to ask a quick question before I start um, drawing questions from the audience. but. Um, You've both mentioned, both governors, times at the, low, at the state level 
where people have been, Republicans have been willing to sell the public on raising a tax. And you can see that not just gas tax, but even income taxes in some places. But it's not going to happen at the federal level. Um, you can disagree with me. Mm -hmm. I'd be Sadly, way open to that. Right. But, but in addition to the anti-tax sentiment inhibiting action at the federal level, isn't it more fundamental than that, that it's just a distrust of the government being able to do oh, sure. anything right? Jackie, that, that's a great point. Interesting fact. You poll the gas tax nationally, it polls about 61, 38 against. But yet, in the last 10 years, 74% of all transportation infrastructure referendums, ballot propositions, have passed. And they've passed in red states, in blue states. Why? Because the voters of South Carolina, Charleston, voted a half cent, a half a penny increase in their sales tax to revitalize the port of Charleston. Because they know that their economic it's future closer is closer to the people. Right. It's closer to the people. They can see it. They don't have to give it to the big bad federal government. We, we've also been our own worst enemy talking about the abuses in the federal program. We haven't talked about the good things that have come from the federal mm -hmm. program. Like Mike, the Big Dig still polls nationally as a huge boondoggle abuse. Do you want to say anything about that? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it, was no. My, it was my project. Unfortunately, I had nothing to do with its implementation. And I don't say that. Uh, if Fred Salvucci had been responsible for that project, it would have been done in half the time at half the cost. No kidding, folks. I mean, competence is kind of important right. in these cases. And, Jack, yeah. you're right. There's a so, lack of confidence in the federal government. So can I say, so I won't tell the entire report of Miami Tunnel story but here, but one of the reasons I tell the story is because if we don't have projects we can point to that are a really great project. So it took a long, long time to get through the politics to get to the point of the approval and the financing. Once they had it, they brought it in just about on time and under budget. A public-private partnership, a civic works, public works, that is doing remarkable things. It opened last summer. It has already diverted 80% of the trucks from downtown Miami, Miami onto the interstate, thereby opening up the whole downtown area for pedestrians, bicycles, residential areas. It's allowing the trucks to get off faster, carry more, readying the port for the Panama Canal expansion. And if that port can get more goods, then we compete very nicely in the U.S. with Halifax because there are only two ports on the East Coast right now that can handle those larger ships. But this will help port, the Miami port to do that. So it's jobs, it's growth, and it, it was, the, you know, there were nice construction jobs, but only 6,000 construction jobs, and then they were on time. But it's those jobs working at the port. It's all the indirect jobs. Mm -hmm. It's goods going all over the United States, imports and exports. And it's getting those trucks right onto the interstate, saving lives, saving pollution, opening downtown. So here's an example of the right people. All right, some were from Massachusetts. Um, <laughs> but. The, the, the important ones, other than yeah. a, a brain with the message. <laughs> yeah, Chris Hodgkins, too. But, um, but the fact is we have to find those projects, point to them, because that's what builds faith. Then people say, my project, too. Yes, we can do it, because the mail I've been getting since I started going on the road, my book has been out one week. And since I was on media, I've been getting emails saying, yeah, you're right, it's bad, but I don't want to see the gas tax raised because they'll just waste the money because the street near my house isn't fixed yet. Well, one of the problems, and Mike, I think you'll agree with this, is the media, and I don't mean to attack Jackie, she's one of my favorites, but <laughs> when's the last time <laughs> the New York skin. Times wrote about the success of the Miami Tunnel Project? They must have written 500 articles about the big dig. Jackie, let me say one other thing, because I know we want to go out to the audience. Folks, you're looking at a project that came in on time and under budget, and look at this harbor. 
So nobody's going to tell me that we don't have the capacity to do this. As all of you know, I'm somewhat obsessive on the subject of connecting North and South Station by rail. <laughs> and every once in a while, somebody says, oh, no, another big dig and so on and so forth. Please, I don't want to hear that, you know, because cities all over the world are building underground rail tunnels everywhere successfully at a fraction of the cost of these estimates that we've been getting. So um, we've got work to do, but nobody's going to tell me, and then I know you agree with us, that we aren't capable of doing this kind of stuff and that there aren't examples. Miami's one, the harbor cleanup is another, where um, great work was done on time, under budget, and look at it. Look at it. It's a source of pride. It's a source of uh, economic growth and stimulus as well as being a great recreational asset. And in fact, I should say, reading um, Rose Best's book, I came away optimistic. There's a lot of stuff in here to give one hope, even though I work in Washington, D.C. Um, <laughs> so uh, we have mics, I'm told, on both sides. And if you just come to the mic, I'll just go left, right, left, right. and. Um, just uh, one thing I've learned at the Harvard Kennedy School this so-called spring semester is that um, you have to tell people that they need to have a question mark at the end of their statement. Okay. Sir? Uh, good evening. My name is Alexander Rossellino from Newton. Uh, today's Wall Street Journal features a major review of the book Move. And in particular, it quotes Professor Cantor as hoping for a drive to make infrastructure, quote, cool on college campuses. So my question is, how would you motivate and inspire the college crowd and more broadly, the young generation to become concerned and involved with America's infrastructure? How do we get the younger generation involved? The younger generation actually sees sees that this is very important to their future. Um, and the younger generation wants cities to be different. The younger generation is flocking to cities. They want to be able to get around without owning a car. Um, the younger generation wants to use technology. When the younger generation gathers, it used to be gatherings would be, if people were talking about um, something cool, they would be talking about cars and comparing cars. Now nobody talks about cars. They talk about their devices and they talk about their apps. So I have a lot of hope for the younger generation, but as a leading public official pointed out in another part of the country to me, he said, you know, that we, the baby boomers have been living off of big investments made in the 1950s and 1960s and um, we're not willing to make that investment again for our own children and grandchildren. Do either of you governors have anything to say about getting... No, Roosevelt covered it. I've got a half a dozen co-ops northeast and working at the T. They all want to become general managers of public transportation systems. 25 years ago, you didn't see that. Yeah. They were all from Massachusetts? No, no. In fact, a number of them were from Philadelphia. Um, no, but, it, but it's interesting, folks, that there is a lot of interest in, uh, in public transportation and rail as a career on the part of uh, the kids that I'm teaching, and they're terrific. They really are. So, um, Well, Congressman Moulton graduated from Harvard Business School and Harvard Kennedy School with degrees from both places, and what job did he, and he was in the military, what job did he take? General manager of a startup railroad in Texas. That's a good sign. Now he's in Congress. Hi, my name is uh, Ben Bolger, and um, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, there's a bridge called Anderson Bridge, and it connects between Harvard Business School and Harvard Square, and for several years, that bridge has been under construction and creates significant delays on Sturrell Drive and elsewhere. And I think that there's a perception in many public works or infrastructure projects in Harvard and throughout Massachusetts, and indeed throughout the country, that when an infrastructure project begins, it oftentimes doesn't have the full commitment of labor and resources that it needs to be done expeditiously. So I'm wondering if you can comment on why projects seem to take longer in this country than in other places. And a second add-on is, what do you think about new technology like Uber and Zipcar that leverage resources more 
and you know have cars waiting waiting around less. So well, those two let issues. Let me respond to the first part. Um, but people think that infrastructure spending is for government workers. Very little of infrastructure, bridge repair, road repair, et cetera, building out broadband is government workers. It's almost all contractors who are private and hire a private workforce. Um, but government often doesn't do a good job managing projects. So for example, not all places, I think more and more, have incentives for not only on time delivery of the finished project, but incentives to the contractor for early uh, delivery of the project, with obviously good oversight to make sure that it's a quality project, things like that. There's a concept called design build that can radically shorten the time that's picking up steam in governments all around the, the, the country. No question about that. So we're, we're getting there. There's no question about it that we're getting there. Uh, there's technology on bridges, for example, Right now, we often repair the wrong bridge, the bridge that isn't really close to collapsing because we don't have technology. Technology is going to solve that in the next year or two. So yeah, I think you'll see a better delivery system in, in the U.S. But one of the biggest problems, and don't yell at me, but one of the biggest problems is our environmental regulations. EISs of major road projects or a high-speed rail line take a year, two, two and a half, three years. Do you know how long EIS, pro, uh, uh, EIS delays are in China? They don't Zero. Have they don't have EIS. They don't have them. <laughs> now, I'm not advocating that we don't have it, but I, let me tell you a quick little story. When we got the stimulus money, I was governor, and I was bound, we got a billion dollars for roads and bridges. I was bound and determined to be the first state in completion of our projects, because that was what we promised the president. I was president of the NGA at the time, and I promised the president we could do this quickly. So I brought my contractors in, and they filled half the room, and I brought my bureaucrats in the Department of Transportation in, and they filled half the room. I said to the contractors, we're going to put out an RFP. Normally, you get three months to respond to the request for a proposal to make your bid. You're going to get four weeks. You all bitched to me that there's no work, four weeks. You guys over here. Normally, you take six months to decide which is the best project. You're going to get four weeks. Guess what happened? They got it done in four weeks. They got it done in four weeks. And we finished number one, tied with four other states, not Massachusetts, four other states <laughs> for the fastest completion uh, of our spending uh, on the We had a Republican governor at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I won't mention his name. Yeah. Quickly. That bridge, I walk over it just about every day to go to work. It's a source of intense frustration because it's a historic, picturesque red brick bridge. And when it's finished, we will have a historic, picturesque red brick bridge. We will not have the other thing when you said plastics, the graduate, public works. I was going to say sensors. That's the thing to go in. Why aren't we putting in sensors everywhere? As long as you have it dug up. Put in some sensors. Then you can have traffic management. Then you can do clever things. Um, that, enough. I'm, you well, and there was an to. alternative, which was to close the bridge and do it in four months. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Could have been done. I thought that would have been a much more sensible thing to do. One of the reasons it's delayed is not because of incompetence. We're keeping the bridge open. That's a much more difficult project than simply closing right. the damn thing True. down and saying you're not going to use the bridge for the next four months, five months, six months, but it'll be done. Um, it's a choice, but it seemed to me in this case, there was a lot to be said for doing it that way. Sir, on the left. Uh, the name is John Bussinger. I live in Brookline now and uh, was fortunate after Mike to represent the town in which John and Robert Kennedy were born. But originally I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. I'm another Ohio person. And I just can't imagine um, that uh, the, Cleve the uh, Boston to Chicago train would have dead ended in the east side of Cleveland and started again on the west side. So I appreciate what Mike said about connecting North and South Station. But I have a question for the governor. What does he think about adding multiple surface tracks for over a billion dollars at South Station now? And in his uh, estimation, if we did that, would that prevent the north-south railing politically and, and perhaps engineering-wise from ever being accomplished, leaving a dead end at South Station forever? 
and I want you to take this message to national television. Look, folks, the reason people are talking about expanding South Station is because the trains stop. If you connect the two stations, the congestion disappears. So why we're spending time talking about spending a billion and a half dollars on expanding South Station is beyond me. We ought to be moving ahead with the North-South Rail Link, eliminate the congestion, and get on with it. Um, we're going to keep working it. Uh, Bill Weld and I happen to agree on this. That's not often the case. And uh, since he has a little more impact, influence with Charlie Baker than I do, uh, we're going to go up there together and see if we can persuade the current governor that it's time to get on with this thing. But John, expanding that station. By the way, now North Station has got a congestion problem because people keep taking the trains. What are we going to do? Spend that. another billion and a half on North Station? This is crazy, folks. It, that's, this, is, this is the kind of infrastructure uh, problem and projects that we ought to be working on and working on intensively and well. I want to ask an infrastructure problem that doesn't have wheels on the ground or wheels on the rails, and it's broadband. I'm Fred Balfour. I worked for over two decades at a small company in Maynard called Digital Equipment Corporation. We were part of the players that got the ARPANET internet in place. Uh, we took over the PhD program in 1972 at Harvard that brought us ethernet. And as I understand it, our broadband infrastructure in this country is at 16th in the world and sinking fast. Um, could we have some comments on that issue and, and maybe both on why it doesn't work and what would be the horizon if we did have everybody uh, gigabit, multi-gigabit to the household? What would, what would, we, what would we think about? I'm so, curious about this, too, because just in the context of the stimulus bill, which I covered in 2009, that um, that was a major priority of the president's, and then he's since had this program, ConnectEd, to wire all school, make sure all schools in the country are connected. Um, how, where are we on that? Well, the answer is very simple. It's profit and loss. The companies that do this, that represent 85% of the country, they're interested in making money. Mm -hmm. Obvious, they're interested in making money. There are certain areas of the country where the capital investment cannot be justified in terms of what you're going to get back. But that's up to the government to act. We had something in Pennsylvania called Act 30. It was our Telecommunications Act. Fortunately, it came up for reauthorization during my time as governor. And I said the big telecommunications companies wanted to have it reauthorized with certain changes. And I said, fine but you all are gonna build out the rest of the state. If you build out the rest of the state, we'll give you everything that you've asked for. Simple. I mean, we so had this precedent, right, with universal service for phones when those absolutely. were introduced. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, then it was privatized, and now there are arguments about, well, that's now our system, and they're not utility, that the internet isn't a utility anymore. I mean, so we have to, that, our, that fight is still going on. Um, but I just want to echo that it is a big problem, and as long as we are aware of it and talk about it, we can push for solutions, because I still believe in the voice of the people, um, but if people don't know about it, I mean, you can use your cell phone and get 4G service on a remote mountaintop in Turkey, and Jeff Ilmult, the CEO of General Electric, said, and I quote him in the book, that he was on a call to make a deal with a top person in Africa. And he's on the in his car talking on his cell phone. And then he says, oops, I'm going to have to call you back on a landline because there is not good cell phone coverage in Greenwich County. What's the county? Westchester, whatever the county is near <laughs> Greenwich, Connecticut. Affluent area. I mean, we have not tackled this problem either. So unless we put technology and broadband in the same conversation with physical infrastructure, because a lot of that is going to run and improve our physical infrastructure, Roosevelt, as well as letting you summon your Uber. Roosevelt is right. When I say we need a 10-year comprehensive infrastructure repair program, we're talking way more than just transportation. We're talking about water and sewer, which in most 
older American cities is a humongous problem. We're talking about broadband. We're talking about the grid. The, we're developing, I'm sure most of you in the room agree with me that we should have more uh, renewable energy, more solar, more wind. Well, in Pennsylvania, we've got the highest elevation east of the Mississippi, and we've got a tremendous amount of wind farms, but we have a deuce of a time getting the energy from where the wind farms are at the top of the mountains to the cities that need it, because our grid is n not first rate. So we've got to do everything, and we've got to do it comprehensively. And imagine five, six million Americans working on doing all of this for a 10-year period, making 70, 80, 90 thousand dollars a year. Imagine what this would do for American manufacturing. It's so simple. It's as simple as the nose on your face. It's just so frustrating to me. With money at the lowest interest rates we've seen in our lifetime Absolutely. for a sustained but period did, of time. Did, did everyone hear Jackie? But you know, Jackie, we can proceed as we are now to spend $300 billion on a new supersonic bomber, and nobody right. can tell you why. Right. Who's it designed to go after? $300 a billion and a half dollars a plane. Think what $300 billion could do for the well, national rail system. I mean, this is crazy, folks. We've got our priorities. Mike, I was testifying before the Public Works Com Committee in the Senate. One Republican said, you know, you're right. We should probably spend an extra trillion, trillion and a half dollars over the next 10 years, but we don't have the money. I said, the money wasn't in the pipeline for Afghanistan and Iraq either, but you guys managed to spend $2 trillion. What do you say? <laughs> I'm going to go back to the right for a, from my right, for a um, question from a woman now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just had a question. You just touched on water infrastructure. So I wanted to understand from a governor perspective, what did you both see as your top water infrastructure project problems? The sound system is not... Water, water infrastructure, what's the major problem? For? For water infrastructure. Well, it's, it's not that different, except it's easier, because it's something where you can charge the users for what you're doing. Now, when we went to work on the harbor cleanup, folks, um, it wasn't fun, um, because I think I was paying the town of Brookline $150 to $200 a year for water and sewer. We were actually subsidizing these rates, if you can believe this, with state money. And suddenly, I was paying $600, $700, $800, million, uh, 800 a year. Not a huge amount, but it was big. In fact, before you were born, it used to be part of the property tax. You didn't even know what you were paying. But we paid for this, folks. We paid for this by charging users more. And it wasn't fun. I suspect your telephone was ringing off the hook to me in those days. Mine certainly was. Um, but today, who would swap what has happened to this incredible harbor? And we're all paying 600, 700, 800, maybe 1,000 for that. But politically, even though we had some kickback, if you can use use the charges as a way to pay for it, it's just a hell of a lot easier. And Mike's right. The biggest problem that you can't pay for with user charges is stormwater runoff. It's a huge problem, huge problem in every major city and in agricultural areas as well. Stormwater runoff is responsible for polluting the Chesapeake more than anything else. But one thing you can do is you can do several things at once. So Chicago. Um, which I looked at in great detail. Chicago has some aging water pipes that are hollowed out tree trunks. Um, and there was one street where it burst, and I call it, I was gonna write a horror movie, the street that devours SUVs, um, because it swallowed a car. But what they're doing is several things at once. So they're, they're doing a little construction on downtown city streets to get in bus plastic platforms called bus rapid transit. It's sort of a better version of our silver line, dedicated lines, very good for transportation. But they are, as they dig, they're first fixing the water system. So they've got a couple things at once. And if we, this is back to your point about thinking comprehensively. 
you can't think about these things one issue at a time. You need a, to look overall at quality of life and economic benefits in one fell swoop. We had hollowed out logs too. They're on Beacon Hill, as a matter of fact. Oh my God. This next month in June, we'll celebrate the 30th anniversary of the creation of the Massachusetts Water Resources Authority. We don't have them anymore. This harbor is clean. We've got great infrastructure. We've got the best water in America. Don't buy bottled water. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Just take it out of the tap. It's better than that. Um, but it took will. It took uh, leadership beyond just little old me. We had a Senate president who represented South Boston. Bill Bulger was a tower of strength on this, folks. We had a guy named Frank Sargent, who I asked to head up a task force that created the MWRA. A good guy, a decent guy. He was part of this. And we managed to do it. Um, and now I'd like to think that we've got an excellent water and sewer system, and um, we're celebrating the 30th mm -hmm. birthday of this thing, folks. It works, you know. We have time for just one more question, I'm afraid. Um, Hello. Sir. Yes, hi. My name is Jeff Santos. I'm a syndicated talk show host based here in Boston. <laughs> and uh, Northeastern graduate. Rindell, in, on the show today, and Governor Dukakis and Reverend Jesse Jackson are on monthly. Uh, <laughs> and we what talk about these issues. But I think that besides the people in this room, there needs to be a bigger audience. Now, uh, the way the calendar looks, we have a presidential campaign coming up. Just happens to be that we have a senator from New York, Hillary Clinton, a senator from Vermont and Bernie Sanders, and a governor from Maryland. Now, my geography, that's the Northeast Corridor plus access to Montreal, which Governor Dukakis and John Bussinger is on the show as well talk about a lot. To me, I think you guys should take this show on the road. Opportunity to get the message out. Maybe I can follow you if we can get some sponsors and move this show and this very important issue to the top of the presidential campaign agenda. Well, let, Jeff, let me, let me say, we, we should actually end on a question, Jackie, but let me just say that each of, every one of us, uh, Roosevelt, Mike, and I, we talk about this all the time. I mean, I fly everywhere to talk about it for Building America's Future. I've heard the governor on many different vehicles. This is an important book that hopefully will move the discussion dramatically. So we do that. And, and as important as it is for us to do it, it's also important for you to do it. I tell people at the conferences I speak to, go home, talk to your Rotary Group, talk to your local chamber about giving Congress a permission slip to invest in this country's growth again. So it's not just us. It's okay that we do it, but everyone's got to pick up the cudgel. There actually um, is one more question, and it's mine to our panelists. Um, since we're sitting in this amazing place in memory of, uh, of an amazing public servant, um, and Heather Campion gave me a statistic that just sort of blew me away since I'm of a generation that you could, re you could ask anyone, what were you doing on the day John F. Kennedy was killed? And that person would tell you. And um, uh, I actually did a story the first time I was writing about, uh, I, I talked to a, a newly elected congressman who didn't, it, this came up and he said, well, I wasn't even born yet. And I thought, oh my God, we now have members of Congress who weren't even born, let alone remember what they were doing when John F. Kennedy was killed. Anyway, I, um, Heather says that 80% of the world has no living uh, memory of John F. Kennedy, which I thought was amazing. But I wanted to ask each of you, what did, because um, I know you were all alive when John F. Kennedy was killed. Aww. <laughs> um, as was I, of course. And what um, did he mean to you, uh, or even to your career choice? Governor Rendell, I'll start with you. Well, if I were here giving the speech that I give on infrastructure, I weave President Kennedy into my speech everywhere I go. Because, as you can tell, I think it's time that we really do something. And I think we have to do something. And every time you do something big, as Heather said in her, in her opening, it takes, there's an element of risk. There's no question, it's an element of risk. 
But we used to be a country that was willing to take risks. We were bold, we were courageous. Thomas Jefferson did the, the, the uh, uh, Erie Canal, even though his, his scientists told him it couldn't be built. Lincoln did transatlantic railroad system in the middle of the Civil War. We always managed to take risks to meet challenges. And I said that for all the great speeches that JFK made, and for all the florid, wonderful rhetoric that he had, my favorite speech was when the nation was shocked because the Russians had beaten us into orbit. He came on at a press conference and he said we were gonna get a man on the moon in the next decade. And again, his scientists told him that was a reach, it was expensive, we didn't know whether we could get it through the Congress, but he said what I remember most and what has been a mantra to me in all of the public jobs I've held and in this infrastructure battle. He said, we do these things not because they're easy, we do them because they're hard. If we stop doing hard things in this country, we are going to hell in a handbasket. Rosemary? So I, I certainly think about Sputnik and getting a man on the moon. I'm glad it became a person on the moon. Um, and that was incredibly inspiring because for one thing you can lift your sights up above and then see that we're one planet. And that's very inspiring. I mean, if I could, if I believed in reincarnation and could be reincarnated as anything, I'd want to be reincarnated as an astronaut. astronaut. But there's one other thing, and how can we not constantly remember, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And the creation of the Peace Corps was incredibly inspiring. I was too young, I didn't do it. But when two Bostonians, graduates of Harvard Law School, Michael Brown and Alan Casey, were starting City Year, I see Ira Jackson sitting in the front row. I'm one of the people who sent them to Ira Jackson, who at that time had the money to support them with. But they were starting City Year which was a very much an ask not um, what it does for you, do it because you want to serve others. And I, because of President Kennedy and having that childhood memory, I wanted to support something that served others. And that city year is flourishing today. It became the model for AmeriCorps. It's in 26, almost 28 U.S. cities and two foreign countries, including including Philadelphia, um, which had actually the strongest city year for a long time. And... Um, Redcoats. <laughs> the Redcoats. The Redcoats are but, coming. But that idea of, of something larger than yourself, the ability to look down on the planet and see the whole planet, and then the something larger than yourself in terms of serving others. Very important legacies, Heather. And the kid that organized the Philadelphia program was a student of mine from Northeast. And he didn't and he didn't know and he didn't know what he wanted to do. And we sat at the end of his year, he's about to graduate. I said, What do you want to do? He was thinking about business school. I said, Well, there's this city year thing. And you're not gonna make a lot of money, but uh, I'll write you a letter of recommendation. Let's see if we can get you in. It was quite late. <laughs> and Jim Balfance went to City Year, and he was the guy they sent to Philly. And he's now a great job. What, chief operating he's, officer, he's chief president. executive, he's, he's president, president of City, Year, of City Year. And I'm so proud of him. Look, for me, I don't know that I would have gone into politics if it hadn't been for John Kennedy. He was a Brookline kid, started on Beale Street. Very important, folks. And the politics of Massachusetts back when I was thinking about getting into politics wasn't the greatest. I mean, we were one of the three or four most corrupt states in the country. We had a crime commission who was indicting people every other day. Um, Kennedy was different. Kennedy was different. He was not only intelligent. I remember, Ed, he came to the law school across the river when I was there. He and Joe Clark, former mayor of Philadelphia, United States Senator, were the only two Democrats who were members of the Harvard Corporation. 
And he talked about standing in a corner at a meeting of the Harvard Corporation where he had been before he came over to talk to us, talking to Clark, because he was the only guy that he could talk to, the rest of these folks, you know. <laughs> he didn't make a speech. He just said, I'm here for an hour, start firing away. And I don't have to tell you, 400 Harvard Law students, pretty tough audience. Uh, I came out of that event, and I tell you, I was hooked. My friend Paul Brownis and I got in a car, went to the convention after took the bar exam in Los Angeles. It was a great convention. Not only that, those freeways weren't working even then. <laughs> and I came back convinced that building the master highway plan was a great mistake around here. We had to invest in public transportation. Um, but it's hard to describe just how important he was and uh, how he inspired young people in this country. And he certainly inspired me. Thank you. And thank you all.